Hello and welcome back to day two of Red Hat Summit and Ansible Fest here in beautiful Denver. A little bit chilly today, but you know, what's warming our hearts is all the openness and all the open source that's going on today and we're digging in. I'm Rob Streche, got Paul Gillen with me, Rebecca is flying around here taking a little break and I think what's really fun has been I, I think the openness and the ecosystem. Today has really been a lot about the ecosystem and embracing this and really we're getting, getting to see a lot into those relationships. Well it's all about ecosystem at Red Hat because of course everything is open source so the business model is very dependent on, on partnerships. Absolutely. And we're joined by Steven, Steven Hules who is the VP and GM of the AI business unit at Red Hat. Welcome back, it was like you were just here. It was, thanks for having me back. And we also have Jenny Barovian, who, is the data who works in the data center Silicon platforms at Intel. Hopefully I didn't screw that up too badly. You, you got it, okay, great to excellent. be here, thanks well, for having me. I mean, obviously, Pat was on, on stage. And Yesterday, you know, yeah, it, he was. You can definitely see the relationship. And by the way, we, we had Matt Hicks on yesterday and we were talking about that and just knowing how difficult that is for both people on both sides of that, because it was live. It was live, And it, yeah. it came off awesome. And I, I think, again, it's just uh, a lot of fun. And I, I think what it also underscored is just the rate of change and innovation that is going on in this industry and how these partnerships and how you have to really tie really tightly together. So I, I think, you know, to both of you, Take a minute and kind of share your perspective on how this AI is really transformative and how it's really changing things. Why don't we start with you, Jenny? Yeah, you know, it's, it's really interesting because the, the history of AI is really intertwined with the history of computing, like honestly, all the way back to the beginning. And so a lot of people have pondered this question of why now, why, why is this the boom? Why is this the inflection point for a tremendous amount of value being derived from AI? And you know, I, I, th I think it's really a couple different things that are, that are coming together. Obviously we've had this massive explosion in, in data that we've been trying to harness the power of over, over the course of the past couple decades. And now what you have is the, com the compute, the computational capability really catching up with the compute resources um, available in, in these machines and, and AI-focused cloud data centers that are, being, that are being built out. But really, on top of that, it's the innovation that's happening, right? It's the model innovation to really start, you know, realizing the promise of deriving value from massive amounts of data, and really what we're faced with now is, okay, how do enterprises specifically harness what, you know, a lot of innovation that began in the cloud and all the excitement around generative AI and large language models, how do we apply that to an enterprise environment? And so that's really where I think we're collectively focused between Intel and Red Hat is how do we address those, those enterprise needs? So when we, when we look at what Intel brings to the table in terms of that end-to-end that -end set of opportunities that enterprises are focusing on, on addressing, we've got a set of capabilities in, in the cloud, in data centers, with Intel Xeon processors, with AI capabilities like advanced matrix extensions uh, or, or Intel AMX. We've got our Intel Gaudi accelerators, which Pat talked about yesterday with Matt on stage. A lot of excitement around the acceleration capability that we're offering there. We've got solutions at the edge. We were actually just talking right before we started filming about how tremendous amount of innovation happening at the edge and a lot of different scale of, of computational power that's required there. We've got our Intel Xeon processors, our core ultra processors. Uh, we've got our Arc GPUs as, as a way to um, drive that, that capability for, for inference at the edge. And then we also have our AI PCs to empower and, and um, enable developers to develop AI solutions more quickly. So we're really excited about all of these different assets that we bring for this explosion and build out of, of AI for enterprise needs. Yeah, no, I mean, and Steven, how, how do you, I mean, again. Yeah, I mean, the appetite for AI right now is insatiable, and I think what really changed was the accessibility of, of what's been out there, right? AI's existed for a long time, but with generative AI, it really captured everyone's imagination, and now the expectation is across entire enterprises, every line of business is going to interact with AI. You look at the demand that drives and the ideas now that are being generated because of the potential impacts, and it, it is, like everything Jenny mentioned, like the, the imagination for where workloads will be run, whether it's inference and training, like the, everyone kind of keeps pushing the boundary. So it's, it's exciting to be a part of. Hey Jenny, I want to ask you, I mean, you're facing a 
competitor in NVIDIA who has got a very simple story, it's all about the GPU. Yeah. And it really is, is in the catboard seat right now. How is Intel coming at this, at this market differently? We know that the future of computing is accelerated computing. And we, we know that there is a need and an appetite from our customers and our partners to deliver alternatives in the market for accelerators and, and GPUs. And that's really what we're bringing to the table with Gaudi. And, and for those of you who had a chance to watch the keynote yesterday when, when Pat did that, um, live interchange with, with Matt Hicks, um, he talked about the excitement that was generated around, particularly around Gaudi 3. We actually announced this just about a month ago at Intel Vision in actually my hometown in Phoenix, um, and, and we talked about a lot of different things. We talked about the performance that, it, that it's bringing, really competitive and compelling performance. It is a third generation architecture, so by comparison to the prior generation of, of Gaudi, it's bringing 4x the computing capability, 2x the networking performance, 1.5x the memory bandwidth, and that's, it, it is very competitive versus other, other solutions that are in market today in both you know, raw performance and, and particularly performance per dollar in terms of being able to deliver cost effectiveness but it's also addressing specific needs in enterprise. So we're expanding the OEM ecosystem, um, you know, all, all of the four major OEMs across Dell Technologies, HP, Supermicro, Lenovo, all announced that they would be in market with solutions with Gaudi 3 when we, when we bring it to market later this year in the second half. And we're also expanding the product line as well to support a PCI Express form factor, which is really interesting to enterprises actually, because you can deploy the technology in a form factor that, um, that fits into, into standard servers. And so we know that that's critical, but we also know that there are opportunities to combine the Gaudi Accelerator technology with Intel Xeon technology as well. And so when you look at, for example, a really critical workflow, net, it work, workflow in enterprises in the area of RAGs, retrieval augmented generation, harnessing the power of LLMs but applying these other sources of knowledge, we've demoed, and, and actually over in our show floor right, right around the corner, we've demoed a capability of bringing together both Xeon and Gaudi to um, to, to service different portions of that workflow. So we really look at it as the future is definitely accelerated compute, but we're bringing multiple different assets to the table. Uh, okay, can you, what's the difference between accelerator, an accelerator and a parallel GPU architecture? Um, so, so, we, so Gaudi is, is an accelerator. We also have GPUs in our portfolio as well, and we definitely have a, a forward-looking roadmap that focuses on, on GPUs as well. We are offering developers um, access to the accelerators that we have with open programming models, leveraging open frameworks like PyTorch and ensuring that they can bring their models that they're developing on GPUs today onto those accelerators. Yeah. It, I think and it adds a lot of value, right? So from, from a Red Hat perspective, we get demands from customers to run across a lot of different hardware footprints. And when you start talking about being able to run these generative AI models maybe in edge locations, not everything's going to require a GPU, right? There's a lot of technology that's driving these, these generative AI models to be smaller, more efficient, more effective. That opens up a lot of opportunities for smaller processors, lower power consumption, lower heat footprint, right? More efficient. And that's, I think, what enterprises are really looking for. But all of that across a consistent stack gives them optionality in how they build and then where they deploy. Yeah, yeah I, I think, in fact, I was going to hit on that because it was funny, we were talking about how things get deployed out to the edge in particular when you're talking about the fact that you need uh, latency is a real thing, right? And especially when you're doing certain data apps and having Gen AI being part of a data app and maybe it's actually deployed out to a cell tower, a 5G cell tower, and you want to minimize that, you want to do the inference out at the edge and be able to be responsive and as part of an app, because I think longer term, in, in fact, we had uh, Mo on from Red Hat, who's an engineering head for Instruct Lab, we had her on prior to that uh, at KubeCon just a few months ago when we were in, we were talking about UX and some of the different ways that people are going to interact with these Gen AI products, and it's not always going to be through a prompt. But where, where are you seeing, and how, or how are you seeing and suggesting to enterprises that they really take a strategic approach to Gen AI? And what, what are some of the things that you're seeing and helping them with? So from a Red Hat perspective, like there's a, the rate of change and in innovation in AI is explosive right now. So companies know, like they're going to have to take some speculative bets on technologies that might not take off. But 
they don't want to compromise their entire AI investment. So what we talk to them a lot about is our hybrid cloud story, especially with OpenShift AI, where we can provide a core platform that allows you to build, train, tune, deploy, monitor, and manage those models, but still gives composability. So if you want flexibility to bring in some of those speculative bets, if it doesn't work out, you're not compromising your entire investment. You can still bring in another technology and augment that with, with even make your own innovation and open source innovation. And then underpinning that, right, is a lot of our ecosystem. So we give them the optionality on, based on the type of workload, the specific use case, we can work with different types of accelerators, we can work on CPU, right? As much as we talk about generative AI, the bulk of what's out there is still predictive AI, and we can also run those workloads together, right? So we can do predictive and generative. And so, really, that's kind of our core message to them, is if you're, if you're betting on Red Hat, you're going to be able to have a stable platform for the future that can absorb the changes that are coming and still work with all the innovation that's coming out of the ecosystem. Jenny, I'm curious, your, your title is Data Center AI Product Management. Uh, does that imply that, uh, that Intel believes that the AI training is going to move largely to the data centers, or is it going to be a, cloud, a largely cloud phenomenon? Well, I, certainly there's trading that's happening in, in cloud data centers, um, but I, you know, it, we're, we're seeing definitely um, enterprise interest to not just not only harness the, the capabilities of, of training in their cloud deployments, in their, um, the, the cloud deployments with the hyperscalers, their hybrid cloud deployments, as Steve was saying, but also we're seeing an increased interest in on-prem deployments for both training and for inference, although inference certainly is dominant in on-prem deployments and certainly at the edge. Yeah, I, I, th I think again, it's as we look at it, there's also the whole idea that Intel really does lean into the open aspect of this as well. Help, help people understand some of the announcements. I think you know, Pat made some announcements recently uh, with the Linux Foundation. What, yeah. what is it that really your lean, Intel is leaning in with open source and with developers? Yeah, I mean, open source has been critical to everything we've done, certainly everything we've done in partnership with Red Hat over the course of the past 30-ish you know, years or so, and, and certainly what we're driving now with our, with our approach to AI. Um, you know, I mentioned before, taking advantage of open frameworks like PyTorch, um, model communities like Hugging Face. I think there is, you mentioned Instruct Lab, I think there's a lot of really exciting innovation that's going on there in terms of building a community approach to adapting the power of large language models to different enterprise domains. But you, you know, I think we're alluding to the announcement that Pat made around OPEA, or the Open Platform for Enterprise AI, and we initially um, talked about that a bit at Intel Vision about a month ago. The community launched in Linux Foundation immediately thereafter. I think there's about 15 companies that are signed up at this point, including Red Hat. Um, we're really excited to get this community off the ground, and it, it, again, it's really trying to take an open and community approach to accelerating that pace of innovation and pace of development so enterprises can really harness the power of Gen AI. And so, you know, I mentioned before a little bit about, about RAGs. We're um, contributing our RAG implementation to OPEA as, as one area to focus on, on kickstarting that. Um, we will actually be hosting, things are moving very quickly, we're going to be hosting community days next week. So there's an opportunity wow. for anyone to get in on the ground floor and, and participate um, as we continue to build out the technical framework and, and start to build up the working groups there. So definitely a good opportunity for engagement. And a lot of the work we're doing focuses a lot on the, on the consumability of the integration. Right? At the end of the day, the thing that's going to make AI successful is customers' ability to consume it. Right? While it's, it's great to create it and, and it's exciting to play with a lot of the models, really it's, it's the ability to roll it into production that is going to generate the value. When we talk about like, the integration we've done with enterprise AI, it really is a full stack integration where from a customer perspective, your usability, it's invisible to you, right? The components are just there, you're getting access to the optimizations, whether it's at the accelerator layer, at the runtime layer for the model, or at the developer layer for the, the various libraries. So it's, it's an integrated experience that helps you generate value and put those models into production. You mentioned earlier that uh, AI PCs, about 40% of PCs shipped this year are expected to be AI PCs. What exactly does that mean? And of course, the desktop is Intel's wheelhouse. How do you look at the future? How do PCs evolve as AI machines? 
I think there's a couple different ways to, to look at it. I, I think, you know, there's certainly applications that we're all using every day. If you think about, you know, for example, video conferencing applications and the idea to even just make, um, you know, visual processing much smarter. How do we make, you know, things like background images and blur and other enhancements to the ways that we communicate on a daily basis. That's harnessing the capabilities of, of you know, GPUs and, and enhanced AI capabilities um, on, on an ongoing basis. There certainly is an opportunity for smaller language which models running locally on a PC for very low latency and high responsiveness just as part of our normal usage of assistants and co-pilots on an ongoing basis, right? And so a tremendous amount of innovation happening there just as part of productivity applications. Um, developer applications, and then that's actually where I wanted to take it next, which is how do we how do we enable developers to move faster, right? So actually harnessing the the GPU capabilities that exist on the platform as a proxy for what they're developing for ultimately in an enterprise data center or in the cloud. So it's a way to get started on your development and build code that ultimately scales to a broader deployment. And, and we're seeing the same trend, right? I mean, you, you mentioned Instruct Lab, and I'm sure Matt mentioned Rel AI and what we're delivering there we are seeing a demand for developers to be able to work with these language models on their, their PCs and then be able to move those up into production. And so like we're taking advantage of all the innovation that's happening on AI PCs. And then when, when you're ready to move like Rel AI into production, we can roll that into an OpenShift AI and roll it across the enterprise. So we're really starting to mirror what you saw for application development now for AI, right? And again, moving, taking big steps toward overall consumability. Yeah, no, I, I think that totally makes sense and I, I think that's a great place to leave it beyond the fact that how do people find out more? Uh, I hear there's a blog that they can sign up for or something <laughs> like that. Well, there's all kinds of stuff, right? We've, yeah, we've got an AI blog that you can sign up for. The other thing that I would, I would encourage developers to check out in particular, we've talked a little bit about Gaudi. We've gotten a lot of questions asked about how do we get access to it. One, one thing that, that Pat talked about yesterday as well that I'll emphasize again is that we do have um, Gaudi 2 and will have Gaudi 3 instances on Intel Tiber Developer Cloud empowered by Red Hat and Dell Technologies and so that is another way for developers to get access and, and um, develop for now and, and into the future. Certainly there's an opportunity to also engage in, in various communities. OPA is one, one place, but we're, you know, this, this, like you said, this whole conversation is about open source and communities and, and so lots of, lots of opportunities to develop the, the open approach to enterprise AI in the future. Yeah, and, and here you don't have to go far. I think I saw four or five of the Instruct Lab sweatshirts wander yep. by. Well, so go, join the Instruct Lab community, get started with with large language models on your laptop, and then have a look at us at uh, OpenShift AI as well. Not to mention Podman, but. Podman, I, yeah, I, Podman I, AI, I, I, yeah, see, yeah. I'll help you out with that, so. <laughs> but hey, thank you both for coming on board. Really appreciate it, you did wonderful, and uh, you know, hope to have you back soon. All right, thank Thanks you so for much. Me. And thank you for watching this episode of theCUBE from Red Hat Summit and Ansible Fest here in sunny, frigid-ish. Denver today, high altitudes getting to me, you know, getting a little wacky, but we're still here, got a lot more to come, so stay tuned to theCUBE, the leader in high-tech information analysis and news.